are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com. Good evening and welcome to Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins. Welcome to the show for January the 13th. Wow, it's the 13th. That's always an interesting number. I'm certain something will crop up in terms of uh, a 13 in our conversation or synchronistically somewhere in the cracks and corners of this place we call Off Planet TV. How you doing? It is uh, the second week of 2016. And uh, there is a lot going on right now. It is going to be a busy year, folks. It is uh, actually promising to be a roller coaster ride. First, mm, the U.S. elections or non-elections. Um, except for Trump, we don't really have clear candidates right now. Um, I guess a lot of people are holding their breath to see if Hillary Rodham Clinton goes down for he her emails. Benghazi, the racketeering at the State Department under the Clinton Foundation. Um, all of this is a jumble right now. It's a fascinating thing to watch if you uh, have an interest in such things. It goes into a lot of it, too. We have given so much of our power away to politicians and uh, authority figures, and the illusions of voting for leaders is part of a system that we buy into. We give consent. So we need to be very careful about how we do this participatory democracy thing. Um, I'm still not sure if Trump is a ringer or Clinton ploy to split an opposition on the Republican side. Um, but the system's broken. Voting for leaders, again, is a vestige of the age that's now closing. And this wave of awakening that's taking over now is going to ramp up and um, many people in this realm I think are going to be whiplashed and a lot of this is necessary now it's a necessary period of some very abrupt changes energetics are ramping up and um, changes are going to become violent and um, uh, I've been talking to some people in the background we're pretty much convinced that there were timelines which were altered several times by the cabal elites, and those are now being recorrected. And that trajectory is going to move us forward. The elites seem to have changed these timelines to stave off evolutionary changes in consciousness, which they knew were coming. And they've used numerous events, uh, staged natural disasters, false flags, uh, extreme technological interference to buy them time because they've missed a lot of their benchmark goals between uh, 2011 and 2013. So while all of these timeline aspects are rather dubious from an advanced perspective, they nevertheless are real as most humans are trapped in this black cube matrix. Uh, we've kind of been left here with stunted psychic capacities and um, tampering, both by off-world beings and humans as well, and um, stuck in this quarantine for probably about 100,000 years now in uh, what is kind of a form of AI. Uh, there's another aspect to all of this as well. There's a lot of false programs that run. One of them that I've been taking note of lately is the false Gaia programming, the one that says that um, the planet cannot support 7 billion people, that you are probably either going to have to be genocided or you're going to have to suicide yourself out. 
This is coming from some very dark voices, some of them channelers and people who are bringing out a false Gaia spiritual complex. <clears throat> we want to be careful of that. We want to be on our guard about um, false spiritual voices that speak to us. I don't believe this planet intends for anyone to suicide themselves out or sacrifice their children. I don't believe that that comes from anywhere except the cabal. It's uh, kind of mirrored in the Georgia Guidestones, Agenda 21, the programs that have come out of uh, the Tavistock Institute for over a century now. And uh, it is false. Um, your life is precious. This planet is precious. And we walk in a delicate balance right now, but we can make this. And um, as we enter this year, we need to focus on opening up to the wave of advanced conscious energies that are coming in. Uh, I believe we only have 2016 to prepare at this point, uh, to have systems and people in place, and also to use this time to find each other and inform as many people who are willing to listen and hear. Uh, my considered opinion is that the bulk of humanity will not hear, will not see, or pull out of the matrix mentality, and we need to be prepared for that. We also need to prepare to embrace the kindred spirits around us. This year, 2016, is a year of connections, and uh, we want to make the most of that as we go into this. It is truly a time when we can find those others out there, and that's a message that's going out very strongly from this show and will continue to do so this year. To that end, um, tonight, I am privileged to have with me someone who I've known of and I think we've kind of maybe danced around each other over the years and uh, we finally get an opportunity to meet her on Off Planet TV face to face. I want to introduce you tonight to Hillary Ramo. Hillary, good evening and welcome to Off Planet TV. Hi, Randy. It's nice to it's meet good you. To see you. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. This is long overdue. It is long overdue. <laughs> you and I have kind of, I, as I said when we were chatting earlier, we've kind of danced around this for um, several years. We've sort of encountered each other. I'm familiar with your work. And we have some mutual friends as well. And uh, I think everything comes in due time. Connections, critical connections happen for a purpose in a time and a season, and I think we're in that, that period right now as I was talking about in my intro. Um, your website, by the way, is hillaryramo.com, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, and um, is there any other places where people can find you, where they can connect with you as well? Uh, sure, they can find me on social media. They can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, I do a variety of different things. You can also find me on uh, Capricorn Radio, Achieve Radio. Ah. So I'm doing a bunch of things. I'm around. Capricorn Radio, my friend James <laughs> Swagger. Yeah. Yeah, we need to shout out to James Swagger. Dude, you need to come on. We need to talk. <laughs> um, James and I go way back. Uh, I think I was probably one of the first people to interview him way back in the day when he would put his first book out. Oh, great. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, there's so much to cover with you, and uh, you define yourself for us, what, how you see yourself, your goal, your mission. Uh, you're an intuitive, clairvoyant, you're an author, you have done extensive amounts of research. How do you define yourself, Hillary? Oh, God, that's such a big question. Well, you know, <laughs> I define myself as a woman who's curious and doesn't have any parameters to that curiosity. Uh, I started radio in 2005. I went on to achieve. I was there for a, a decade. I took a break last winter in 2015, and I took a sabbatical for about six months before I started to come back on. Um, James found me and brought me on to Capricorn, and mm -hmm. here I am again doing radio. So I think for me, my spiritual path uh, led me to a lot of really great places and a lot of great experiences and a lot of great people. And um, I was always a seeker, so I've always been seeking. And what really propelled my career into the alternative media was uh, finding my way to David Icke's work, 
reading every single one of his books, having my psyche kind of blown open. <laughs> and I, I needed to do something. I needed to have an outlet for the information. I needed to have some kind of, you know, way to um, discuss the material, talk about what's going on in the world, and open up other people's minds and their eyes because mine were literally opened up, you know, wide. So mm -hmm. I started really, that's how I started. And, and who am I? I? I'm just a, just a woman who's out in the world doing what everybody else can do if that's what they're called to do. <laughs> You're, uh, you, you, you kind of cover a lot of territory. Uh, one area of course is obviously your intuitive work uh, in terms of, you consult with people. People come to you for uh, advice, insights. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I've always been uh, an intuitive person. You know, even as a child growing up and just you know, call it psychic, call it whatever you want. I went through a period of complete rejection of it. Didn't want anything to do with it. Wasn't willing to even use the word psychic. I thought, you know, when I used the word psychic, I had these visions of the 1-800 neon light in my window. Yeah. Yeah. And I absolutely... Yeah, Warwick advertisements, yeah. yeah, I, yeah I, re whole. I refused to, to do it. I just mm -hmm. absolutely didn't want anything to do with it. But what happens with things like that is it just keeps knocking on your door. It just keeps coming and it keeps manifesting in ways and you can't stop visions. You can't stop insights. You'll end up driving yourself crazy. So what I had to do was go through my own awakening process with the fact that this is, a, this is something. When I was a child, I just thought everybody did it. When I was a teenager, I thought nobody did it. It made me weird and I didn't want to be weird. So I stopped as much as I could. And then when I got into my 20s and my 30s, I was able to embrace it and realize that, you know, it really is something that not everybody can do necessarily, but I think everybody has the ability to do it. So I think mm -hmm. it's it's a human ingrained uh, right that we have. We if we develop it and we are honest with it and we you know we learn how to use it for for whatever it is we're supposed to be doing, then it manifests in a way that's beautiful and creative and fantastic and you'll find your space and your spot and you'll find your niche and you'll navigate to where you're supposed to be. And here I am. So when people come to me and uh, we do readings, we'll go into a topic, we'll, we'll discuss maybe a life event, um, I get impressions off of that, and it goes from there. I'm never really in charge, Randy. Oh, I can't hear you. I've lost, I've lost your audio, Randy. I can't hear you. But, uh, I just had a system that, that was doing audio blowback through my system. I had to mute out. Sorry about that. Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, it's kind of a complex setup. Anyway, um, <laughs> for you, what, what is, did you find it growing up, for instance, you were more attuned to people emotionally? Did you pick up um, the vibes in a room, the sense of... Um, people's emotional states or yeah. did you kind of feel that that intuitive empathic pull that comes whenever you're you're sensing well the way it works for me and it works it works in different ways for people but the way it works for me is the emotional energy i can feel your emotional energy before you can express it so for me if somebody is telling me something but inside their emotions aren't matching what they're telling me i can absolutely see right through that yeah. And so what happens is it gets frustrating and it, and it was a process of frustration that really opened me up to be able to really, you know, make peace with this was that it's like you just people cannot tell me one thing and be feeling another thing. So yeah. it, it's kind of like, well, you, you know, you can't really make somebody tell you something if they're feeling if they're not in touch with their own feelings and they're not able to express it. You really can't do anything about that. You know, you have to hope that the person you're dealing with is honest about their feelings and it matches the energy. It's really about energy. It's about the energy that you're putting mm. off. I mean, we all know when somebody walks into a room and they're massively in love, they look like, that. you know, they're glowing. Yeah. And we all know when yeah. somebody walks into a room and they're absolutely pissed off. 
it changes the energy yeah. and we're all so connected yes whether you're psychic or not or whether you've been, you're in touch with your psychic abilities or not we're all so connected that you really can't get away with not having some kind of connective input and some kind of connected output to what's going on so that's kind of you know it comes in as an emotional thing but that's kind of how i've been able to navigate it so basically you reach certain points in time where you really just wanted to shut all that down yeah yeah of course i mean i went through a whole period of rejecting it yeah almost yeah. that's like almost a universal story of anybody that is highly naturally empathic is that at some point you want to turn that off because it's like so much going on in your head and in your in your heart i mean a lot of this my sense registers not so much up here as down here mm. in, in the heart chakra and the energetics that come in this part of the body a lot of times the sensing comes from that area what do you how do you function how do you how do you operate well how do i operate well i just be myself <laughs> it's kind of a rough <laughs> term but i don't really have an operation um <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I just had a session the other night with, with somebody and it was an extremely eye-opening experience because I still get these moments where I work with people and it's like, wow, that was so amazing. Um, and we had a, we had a, um, we moved into a past life memory and this person was a woman in this past life who was pregnant and died a very traumatic death. And so I emotionally was connecting to the child this person was pregnant with and there was all kinds of messages coming through and it was just spontaneous and it was just kind of bubbling up like a volcano and coming out and um i had no idea the connections to what i was saying to what the person on the other end of the receiving end was going to have to it so once i just i mean as long as i'm staying true to me and i'm letting this stuff come out as it needs to come out um, and sometimes none of it makes sense to me, but it has mm -hmm. something to do with, so, so I'm really not in the process. I'm just, I'm just like an open kind of channel. And so the things that were coming out of my mouth, I mean, we're just blowing this person away because I, he had never told me any of this information. And so it was just this, this beautiful give and take of confirmation. And I think what happened, I, I, I was a little different than most people, I think, because my grandfather was a psychic. And my grandfather was a psychic out in the world working as a psychic and mm -hmm. way before the internet age. So he was doing the psychic work. He was doing biofeedback. He was traveling to pyramid sites and he was doing all kinds of things um, on top of working a regular job and raising a family. Um, so when I grew up, you know, he was he was always kind of there for me and he was he would do these little things with me, these little these little games and, and stuff. And so I was lucky to have somebody who was very supportive in what psychic energy is and does. And so I, I was very grateful for that. But still I rejected it at one point. I went through a period of time in my teenagehood where I just wanted to be a normal teenager. I didn't want to, you know, do the same. I didn't want to have these impressions, but it still never left. I mean, I would go to a party and I'd be like, oh my God, I can feel everybody's thoughts. And it's mm -hmm, crazy. Mm -hmm. So there was a little moment where I had to get kind of a handle on it. Um, and that really began when I started doing some seeking and working in some shamanic circles and understanding psychology and going to school for traditional education and coming out of that and then seeking alternative education, energy, 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 learning about chakras, learning about ceremony, learning about uh, spirit and, and how to connect on those levels. And that's really what grounded it and brought it into kind of a full circle thing and I was able to to ground in that and move forward so my advice to anybody who struggles with it is to not struggle with it is to just accept it and understand that I, I believe that humanity is evolving towards a more sensual telepathic yeah psychic type of understanding where you yes. just have to accept yes. the fact yeah. that you're doing this and this person's doing this but what happens is when you get together and you do it together you start to have these and i've done it a couple of times with different people um where you meditate together or you do something energetic together and you say hey let's try this and see what happens yeah. oh my god it's the most amazing thing ever and so 
it just kind of cleans the slate of the negativity, the typical stuff that you get caught up in or you get distracted with, or the stress levels just push you through the roof. If you stop and say, oh my God, I really think that I, I, know, I know I need a timeout. My body's telling me I need a timeout. So-and-so is telling me I need a timeout. And then you, you just switch the gears to to trying to understand and experiment with humanity's higher abilities. You'll start to see that we have a whole skill set as humans that we have not really explored. That's exactly, you know what, I'm so glad you brought that up. That was kind of what I alluded to in my intro tonight. Um, so much of our innate abilities as a race, as humans today, has been shut off in some way. I mean, you know, all of the stories that I've found seem to indicate that there was, in fact, efforts made to switch us off genetically, certain DNA strands deactivated, psychic skills that were basically buried and lost as a result of the fact that we as a race didn't use it. But we all have these innate abilities. We're all intuitive on some level. We all have the ability to do things that we consider to be so-called extrasensory or sixth sense type thing. But developing it is probably the most challenging thing right now because there's a lot of people who are struggling to break out of the box. There's a part of them that's like, it's almost like a birthing process. There's something that wants to be born in humanity, and it's the, re the restoration of these abilities. What are you seeing in that realm in terms of emerging consciousness and an attempt to bring humanity back into alignment with our extrasensory perceptual skills? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I see it as a quantum consciousness. I see it as an ability to be able to reach into things and see and understand and, and, and feel things that we haven't, we have been shut off in a lot of ways. I just was reading an article the other day that they've discovered the seat of consciousness, the on off switch of mm -hmm. consciousness lies in a certain part of the brain. And it was a, a tech company that had launched the article. And I said, God, that's kind of scary because I've been following the technology and uh, the evolution of different technologies. And I've been watching it very carefully. Um, and what I see is a slippery slope when it comes to understanding the human being yeah. so well that you're able to really access things that are sacred. And mm -hmm. when you access things that are sacred within the human being, you better be ready to handle, you know, what comes out of that. Whether you're in, you know, you're in a human relationship experimenting with those things or you're hooked up to some kind of technology that is actually going in and doing that for you. Um, I, see, I see something happening to people that allow themselves to go into those spaces. And I see something happening to people who don't allow themselves to go into those spaces. And it's almost like they're fighting themselves. They're running around in circles. They can't ground themselves. They can't uh, figure out what their passion is. They can't align themselves with people uh, in, in a soul connection type way. And they get lost and angry and sad and hopeless. But I think the human condition is a hopeful story. And I think that, you know, nature itself has had success in billions of years of evolution. And if we ignore that, then we're pretty stupid. If we don't think about how nature evolves towards life, I don't agree with the, the Gaia, some of the Gaia project, projections you were talking about earlier where, you know, oh, we're either going to have to all die or this or that. Well, nature's going to take care of that anyway. All she needs to do is really blow Yellowstone and the whole world has a reset button. I mean, there's so many natural cycles on this planet that have the ability to reset things. And I think, you know, once the balance becomes so off, rebalancing something is vital and necessary, just like within the human body. I think we're microscopic, uh, we're microcosms of the macro. And once we realize that we are all connected, you know, that our emotions, you know, I worked with the Native Americans for a long time. It's one of the things I've done. And one of the belief systems that they have is that human emotion creates weather. So when you get together in certain ceremonies, you actually have prayers and things and, and par parts of the ceremony that can affect weather. I've actually seen clouds clear after doing yeah. 
wedding ceremonies and I've seen rain happen after rain ceremonies. I mean, I, I've witnessed it. I've been in it. So it's like I know that when people reach a certain level of cognition, when they reach a certain level of understanding and consciousness, it takes a little bit of practice. You know, it takes a little bit of self-care and self-compassion and then compassion for others if they're not quite there or if they're beyond you. Uh, an ability to be humble and to be able to learn and to be able to experience versus compare and compete. You know, we've been bred as species to be competitive, to be manipulative, to yeah be yes. secretive to be uh you know comparing ourselves to this and that and, and striving for certain things materialistically it's all part of a program and the program is completely unsustainable we've been living in an unsustainable consciousness and i believe that what people really feel when they want to pull out of that when they feel the parameters and there's something calling on the other side of those parameters saying man it's it's a level of consciousness that is sustainable that's saying to the person call it your higher self call it whatever you want come on over here this is where you're supposed to be this is where freedom is this is where true love resides you know um I don't know. I, I think humanity has uh, a lot of hope, and I think that we have an ability to be able to change, you know, some of the things that we are doing just by simply waking up and being authentic to ourselves and trusting the process, trusting others, moving into a different type of paradigm. It's just going to take work because we've been generations and generations and generations of bread consciousness to yeah. fit a capitalistic structure that is destroying a planet in ways that the planet really has never seen before. So the planet is going to react as nature and then you have weather manipulation. And so what happens, and you know this because being in the alternative in industry that we're in, um, we deal with information and we deal with uh, several different qualities of information. We have low quality information and we have high quality information. And I think we were going to talk about this a little bit tonight about yeah. some of the alternative media things. It's, well, think. it segues real nicely. Because yeah, well, basically... yeah, it does. It does. And I've been in the industry for a long time. And as a woman in the industry, I've seen, I've seen a lot from a very unique perspective because most, most in the, in the alternative media industry are men. Um, most come and go. They don't have a long-term um, experience in it. I've been in it since 2005, and I've seen it all. I've seen it behind the scenes, in front of the scenes. I've seen it, uh, you know, pretty much everything. But what I can say, and I will speak to you about that, is the quality of information. We have to be really careful with where we get our information from. It's so easy to inject disinformation into the alternative media. And people regurgitate that information without question, and they run around and they, they regurgitate that all over the place. And so it's become kind of a circus. And I think we have to get back to like that integrity, Randy, that level of integrity where we take information, we make sure we source check it, we fact check it, we go through the whole thing to make sure it's a legitimate piece of information. And we don't just, you know, put on pedestals big famous names and big famous speakers, the ones who do the circuit, the one who go to the conferences, the ones who everybody interviews. I think we have to start listening to, to not just celebrities. We have to start listening to the people who are coming in who have these experiences of consciousness, who may not necessarily be well known or even known, but we have to open up kind of an avenue for people to get their voice out because truth yeah. doesn't just manifest in a paycheck to somebody who gets paid thousands and thousands of dollars to stand up at a podium or come onto a show and talk about their 20 best selling books. Um, because they're tied to that information. They haven't, they're tied to the information in their books. They're tied to the information that defines who they are. They're, they're, they're tied to information in a way that's, you know, can go this way or that way. You know, but when you start bringing in, uh, people who are not tied to information, you start to really find some kind of magic that lives there. So I don't know. I like to interview people who are, who are known. And I also like to interview people who are not so well known because, yeah. 
it's the one person who has a calling to write or self-publish a book about, you know, an angel experience they had or a soulmate experience that they had or, you know, a nature experience that they had that, that might actually be the seed that actually has the power to change things. So I'm never going to close off my whatever you want to call it to somebody who well yeah. you're not you're not going to give me enough hits on youtube or you're not going to make me enough money no I, do, I don't think that that's the way we need to go and as a host in this industry for a while um i have found that sometimes some of the some of those shows are some of my greatest shows and i learned the most mm -hmm. um, so i appreciate i appreciate all spectrums of that and i'm sure you can relate to that too that's kind of been what uh I've tasked myself to do over the years was to give uh, voice to people who have not been heard before. I mean, obviously, there are people out there that I want to interview. I want to talk to them because they're interesting. Some of them are well-known. Some of them are, I guess, what you would call kind of rock stars in the system. But, you know, really, organically, the way this plays out for me anymore is this is an ongoing conversation that doesn't stop when this show ends. It is part of a conversation that I have every day with people. And some of them are people that I know in real life, so-called, and some of them are people that I talk to on Skype or on the telephone. And it's community building. Again, by allowing people to have that authentic voice to come on and present what it is that impacts them, we're now able to aggregate information that has been stifled. You know, we never really, in the age of radio and television, had the opportunity as the populace, the people, the public, whatever you want to call it, to have access to that. All of that was locked down right from the start, especially television. Television was never given to the public. Radio was for a while. So the Internet came along, and it seems coincidental um synchronistic that it appeared in this time when we were also going through this uptick in consciousness and in fact the the media itself or the web has been a part of that it's enabled people who would have been considered well fringe kind of offbeat kooky we're talking about things now we did not talk about 10 years ago uh, there are voices who would have not been heard a decade ago. There are people like yourself who have been able to gain a profile to put out information that at one time was considered sort of to, as you said earlier, kind of the late night TV 800 <laughs> number dialing thing, which is a shame because that was an unbalanced view as well mm -hmm. because it was commercialized. So suddenly you have an authentic voice to come out and begin to present material that gives somebody else the courage to go, you know what, I don't feel so crazy anymore. I don't feel so isolated anymore. And that organic conversation is the one I want to have all the time. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've come to, when I first started radio, uh, it was funny because even <clears throat> like Reiki was something that people were like, oh, I don't want you know. Oh, yeah. You know, you talk about Reiki now, and everybody's a Reiki master. Everybody's done Reiki. Everybody gets Reiki. I mean, Reiki is like the cool thing to do now. Um, and I remember picking my shows according to, you know, information that was kind of on the fringe and that nobody really had heard about or was talking about. So that was great. And now I look around and I'm like, God, everybody talks about it. So I feel really honored to have been part of that early on back in the early 2000s to really be able to bridge that out to the world. I, I, you know, I, I never really thought, well, I'm just one woman with one voice and have this internet radio show, but at least I was able to get on there. And uh, for nine and a half of the 10 years I was on there, I was number one on the Chief Radio Network. And I was, I was always amazed by that. I'm like, really? I would always ask my producer, like, really? Are you just telling me that? So I keep going. Um, but yeah, I... I, you know, we're in such a great place, Randy, with, with the way that we're able to reach people. And uh, I think if the alternative truth industry, for really truthers, truly truthers, um, we need to work together and we need to stop bashing each other and we need to stop having this ridiculous 
cat fighty type energy because I see it all the time. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to name names or get into any of that stuff, but it's kind of like, yeah. God, you know, well, if so-and-so just worked with so-and-so and they came together, I mean, what kind of magic would come out of that? Conversation you were just talking about is one of my favorite things. Like, honestly, I, I live for it now. I live for that higher level of conversation. And if I don't have it, I get really, I get really like sad. It, it mm-hmm. almost affects me emotionally because yeah. I'm, I, I know what it feels like. I know what it does to my body, to my spirit, to my mind. And I mean, I'm just not willing to sacrifice. I mean, if we're going to get together and talk, let's talk about something profound and let's, let's stir each other's minds and let's, let's light up our consciousness so that we can, I don't know, see further or figure things out or have some kind of epiphanies. I mean, isn't that more fun than complaining and not and getting into gossipy type conversations and um, I mean, let's face it, sometimes we have to have these kind of conversations that aren't always like that. But, I mean, let's at least make them log- logistical and then move on. Because yeah, I, there's nothing I, worse than getting stuck in a conversation that drags you down energetically or doesn't inspire you and ends up making you feel worse than when you started. One of the things that I think you and I wanted to touch on tonight is to try and elevate the conversation and not to be catty. I've called people out and I'm not afraid to do that, especially when I know that they are operating with obviously bad intentions. And right now it's very dangerous. The internet has, has been seeded with, I will call them agents, provocateurs, people whose intentions are less than pure and people who are working say defeat you know in the end I, I think the win would be to watch these dark people come to our side and realize that they're part of us too and end the wars that have gone on for hundreds of thousands of years on the planet i don't so much view them as enemies but they are opponents in the sense that we are trying to advance a higher consciousness to the planet right now. We are attempting to raise people up, to elevate them, to get them to understand who they are, what their gifts are, and what their destiny is on the planet. And a lot of the conversations that I see now go into the realm of, well, there's no nice way to put it, pissing contests. (laughs) And, you know, one of them them is um, Flat Earth, which has become this, incredible what flat earth has become one of these incredible um heated debates between people that's so polarizing and i don't really care where you where people stand on it it's an organic inquiry for some people they become they become fascinated by the evidence it seems to indicate that the science behind a spherical earth doesn't really work and the questions about the integrity of science coming from NASA. I find those to be incredibly compelling arguments. Now, as to what the planet is exactly, I have my own opinions, my own thoughts about it, but I've seen the horrible wars that have occurred as a result of this. You even bring it up, and you automatically polarize people. It's like we can't entertain this because something about it endangers a paradigm that's very intrinsic to certain people. Have you seen this? Well, I have seen it, and, I, and I've and i kind of just been watching it. I, I get some people asking me about it every now and then to weigh in, and I haven't weighed in on it. But what I have thought and about... And you're not being asked to do so here tonight either. No, no, no. I, it's okay, and it's okay if I am, because this is how I'm going to weigh in on it. I mean, at one point, we thought we were the center of the universe and everything revolved around us. And I've seen the maps, I've seen the things that people, I mean, this was just the reality. Mm-hmm. And what I find really beautiful is that one person somewhere had the courage to have a thought. And that thought became something else. And then they had the courage to go up against the conventional thought, which is like a tsunami 
mm-hmm. compared to a little strand of grass, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's this tiny yeah. little fragile idea that turned into something else that turned into what we now know or think to be true. So, I mean, somewhere along the line, somebody had a thought that changed a paradigm, changed a way of thinking. And then here we are, fast forward 2016, and, you know, we know or we think the sun is the center and we revolve around the sun. So I, what it tells me is that, you know, maybe somebody has had a thought that the earth is flat and God bless them. I mean, please go out and do the science and do the, do the research and maybe eons down the road our future descendants will say oh my god remember the time when they used to think that world was round yeah yeah right so much so the beauty that i find in the whole debate really is the fact that we have an ability to be original in our thinking and in our in our consciousness and and what if that person had been like afraid oh my god i can't go up against the establishment um my career will be ruined I will never be taken seriously again ever as a scientist. And they cowered and they went away and they didn't do it. I mean, maybe that would have been birthed through somebody else. Maybe that would have happened eventually. Who knows? But I I just, I really think it just gives us a a clear message that we need to remember that we don't know everything. And if we can stay open to the possibility of the unknown, even a little bit, then things will creep in through there and moments will creep in through there and experiences will creep in through there. And we will have either ourselves or the generations coming up behind us give us the necessary information and, and do the necessary Okay, we're back on the air. Uh, and we do have technical problems from time to time, as you can imagine. Um, kind of Welcome a complex... To live radio, Randy. It's live. <laughs> and, and, you know, honestly, the beauty of it is that it's a high-wire act. You know, the technology can fail. We can fail. And we just do this. It's it's that's what's and fun the about show it. Goes on and we keep going. And we have we have a consummate professional behind the boards with <laughs> with our friend Biggie at CCN, which uh, I sometimes fail to say thank you to. And so we are back live, and you are here with Off Planet TV and my guest Hillary Ramo, and we are we're kind of riffing through a lot of things at once. The conversation about the alternative media. You know, in one sense, we are just, we're that, we're media. The term media itself simply means something that sits as a layer between the presenter and the listener. So in a lot of ways, the goal, and part of this is demystifying the technology, the goal is to remove those layers, to become more transparent, to open up as much as we can the ability to be responsive, and accessible. Um, I don't know about you. I spend a lot of time answering emails, making phone calls, talking to people on Skype, chatting. Um, I think that's an important aspect of this that kind of brings the walls down a little bit on media. We, we, we become people again and not talking heads. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. I mean, I spend time too interacting and I, and I just think that if you don't do that, you kind of put yourself into... I don't know. Uh, you put yourself on a pedestal in a way, and I think that the age of the pedestal is over. And I and I don't think that it's not. You know, I, I've seen it a lot where people have great ideas. They're very spiritual, but they don't have the business sense, or they have the business sense and they just start, they're not connected to the spiritual stuff. But when you have somebody who is connected to the spiritual stuff, does have the business sense, uh, you have an effective you have an effective ingredient there. And um, I don't know. I, I just think people like to to talk, and it's not about about, you know, always making money and doing that, of course, but making money is a part of what you have to do. I mean, if you yeah. want to be on the air and you want airtime and you want to make something of it, you, you need to have financial, you know, you need to have a financial balance as well. So let's talk about that for a minute. You have a book that you've written called Money Matters, Understanding Your Relationship with Abundance, and you kind of go into, I guess, what's loosely called the law of attraction. The concept of um, prosperity, which this is probably one of the most polarizing subjects because there are people at all points in the continuum but between those who are able to attain a certain level of financial prosperity 
are those who seem to constantly struggle with this. The, the whole principle of the ability to connect financially with a situation, to have prosperity, the, the, the concept of being able to do attraction. Let's talk about that a little bit because in some ways that's been kind of beaten to death through the the pop culture that's attached to it. And yet I know it's a very sound principle and it's a principle that I still don't think is understood despite the hundreds and probably thousands of books that have been written and seminars and all the other things. Yeah, it's a big topic. Um... I think there's this misunderstanding that if you're a spiritual person, you reject money. Yeah. And if you're a wealthy person, you reject spirituality. Um, I have a lot of friends on both ends of that spectrum. I have some very, very wealthy friends, and they are very spiritual people. I have some very poor friends, and they're still very spiritual people. So it's kind of like, you know, I wrote this book way back in the early 2000s before Abraham Hicks came out with his Law of Attraction, actually. I didn't have a lot of money, so I self-published it. He had a lot of money behind him with the big publishers, so of course that went viral. But what I did was I really went through my own journey of uh, looking at finances and, and saying to myself, well, how can I take a spiritual approach to my money? Put myself through the test and, uh, you know, spent about a year doing different things to better my financial situation and to, to bring it to where it needs to be. And I still go through stages and phases. But what it comes down to is like, you know, I always tell people, ask yourself, do you, when you build an altar or you pray or you build... You know, you build something that's honorable to your spiritual life. Do you put money on it? Do you put dollars on it? Do you put coins on it? Do you put some kind of money element to it? And, uh, you know, some people do a really good job of that, and some people don't. And the people that don't are kind of taken back, like, well, why would I put money on an, a sacred space? Well, why wouldn't you? Because money is just an energy that you attract to you. You either attract it or you don't attract it to you. Just like you either attract love or you don't attract love, or you attract kind people or you attract mean and nasty people i mean so you kind of got to look at the rest of it it's not just about money but what else are you attracting in your life i mean are, are you not attracting what you want well then you got to ask yourself why why am i not attracting what i what i want well maybe it's because you're not supposed to have it i mean really i mean maybe your experience is supposed to be humble and maybe your experience is supposed to have the opposite of that so i mean i think it's a lot bigger than just you know i want twenty dollars or i want two million dollars and how am i going to go do it but i mean if your goal is to become a millionaire well then what are you doing about it how are you attracting that what steps are you taking um you know it's a very practical approach and i i was teaching a seminar uh, at a college to a women's financial group about 10 years ago and very popular class and these these very intelligent women would come in and we would go through the program and they would just go oh my god i've had it all wrong i've been trying to manifest twenty thousand dollars but it's not right. about twenty thousand dollars it's about right. an abundance that you need to make peace with or understand or understand where your issues are coming from why you think you don't do what were your parents issues with money who was better mom or dad i mean there's so many things it's a psychological process and i broke it down into a psychological process uh and and added the spiritual element and it became really interesting now look at religion for example you have a church system that is just ridiculously wealthy and then when you look at the spiritual system, it's like they're completely broke. So what's going on here? I mean, where, why is this massive, you know, one end of the spectrum to the other? Well, because religion has turned it into a business and religion has turned it into an industry and religion has turned it into control and manipulation and keeping people in cage. So is spirituality about opening up and expanding and getting out of those cages and getting out of the matrix and moving in? Well, money is a part of that. And we're looking at now digital money coming into the scene. We're looking at Bitcoin rising up through the, you know, the, the ranks and... 
It's a really interesting topic to talk about now, this money thing. But I think to answer your question, I don't know, maybe I've lost your question, but to, to really go into it from where I was coming from, I wanted to show people that there was kind of a way out of the traditional thinking when it mm -hmm. comes to money. And I still get clients or I still get friends who talk to me and say, Hillary, what do I do? Because I want to charge for my workshop, but I feel guilty for charging for my workshop because... I'm doing a spiritual workshop and spiritual workshop shouldn't be. And I'm like, what do you, what's the matter with you? You have rent to pay. You have groceries to buy. You have gas to put in your car. You ha might have a family. You might have children to raise. Why would you ever feel guilty about charging for your services? Do you think any other profession says, oh my gosh, I feel so guilty for charging? I don't understand what this is. I mean, it's, it's so ingrained into the mind of this, the, the New Age community that they shouldn't be charging for what they do because it's spiritual work. Well, you know, I mean, why not? I mean, you, it's, just, it's a part of an exchange, and it keeps it clean. Energetically, yeah. it keeps yeah, it clean does. because does. if you go and you do a session on someone and you don't charge them, you're exerting your energy on the session, you're putting your power, your energy into it, and then they're walking away. I don't see that as a clean interaction. I see that as an unbalanced interaction. But if, if the person pays you whatever it is you charge for it, then it's clean. It's done. So I think we just have to look at it as a simple energy exchange. Someone's going to do work for me. I pay them for that work. End of story. Well, psychotherapy's recognized this for as long as it's been in existence, the idea that the payment for the therapy was part of the therapy. You know, there's attaching a value to something because once you invest in it, well, that's where your heart is. That's where your soul is. And so the idea of investing in something, it is one of, you know, this may dogleg off of this a little bit, but I'll try and bring it back. One of the things that I've noticed about internet culture is that everything is presumed to be free now because so much of what we one time paid for is free. Uh, and a good example of that is actually music, which is something that I really have a sensitivity to. And I've watched as download mania destroyed the record industry. And it's not like I'm pure as wind driven snow and never download music, but I also believe in paying for it, and that's, 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 that's just one example. But we now are at this place where so much of what we do is free that people don't stop to think, oh, here's this network. It's called CCN. Great. Look at the shows they put up. Behind the scenes, what they don't realize, for instance, is it costs a lot of money to do this. It has production skills, and okay, I'm going to preach a little bit here. <laughs> there. There is technology behind this that costs money. There is live stream, which costs money. There's people's time, talents, and energy, which also translate into a value that people need to render value back for. So that's an example of the Internet culture that needs to respond if they want to keep this. We're not, and the alternative media has not attained the stature of mainstream media, although mainstream media is sinking so fast now it looks attainable. <laughs> but we haven't, we haven't reached the point where we're, we're able to attain the, the, the um, financial wherewithal of Fox or MSNBC or any of the other networks that are out there. But I, yeah, can I say something to that? Can I say yes. something to Renee? Yes, please. I don't think we ever will. I don't think we ever will because mainstream media is so part of the program. Yeah. It's so part of the program, and there's so much money and power behind it. But it, it's not free. It's not free. I mean, it's funny because it's tied into so much money. It's not free. We're free, and we're tied into to really pretty much nothing. I mean, unless somebody is really legitimately in here to be uh, a mole or somebody that, you know, is here to disrupt things, which, you know, it, it kind of gives us credit because the fact that we have infiltrators into the system it tells us that, you know, we've become kind of, we've popped up on the radar over here for so for yeah. the power structures. And, you know, they're watching who the big voices are. If, if you're not already working for them, they're watching who you are. And they might interrupt your program or shut your website down or, you know, close your YouTube channel. I mean, it's simple things. It's not like they really have to work too hard to get the voices off the air that they don't want on. Yeah. Um, they just don't give you the, the attention. They don't give you 
You don't get the hits on YouTube. You don't get this. You don't get, you know, you, you're not up in the Google searches where you need to be. Right, right. Um, so there's so many easy ways for them to just infiltrate it and disrupt it. And you just got to keep going. You just got to put it out and you just got to be true to yourself. And you have to say, you know, this is about putting out a voice or a signal. Because if we truly, we do live in a digital world. So when you put out a signal yeah. and the signal goes through the whole system, well, somebody's going to hear it. Somebody might listen to this podcast or this pod or that YouTube video and say, Wow, this is inspiring me. You never know what the effects are going to be from your actions. If you and I, people like you and I are called to be on the air and to say things and to, and to have information come out or to bring on a guest and have that information go out, well, we just don't know what the, the, the bottom line effect is going to be. Yeah. But yet we trust it and we do it and we pay for it and sometimes we make money and sometimes we don't. But I think ultimately, those of us who really are in this industry with our heart, it's not about money and it's not about fame and it's not about ego and it's not about any of that stuff. It's about providing a signal of hope for people who might be sitting at their computer at work, happen to synchronistically find a link to your show, listen to the information and say, oh, my God, that changed my life. How do you know that's not happening every single day? I think you and I both know it does happen because I think we both experienced it. And I, it's not me going, oh, yeah, I'm changing people's lives all the time. Because we're vessels, we're able to speak things into the quantum in a way that resonates with somebody on the other end of the tube. And that's just the whisperings of the spirit and the ability of the human to impart some of that. We're conductors in a sense of uh, the resonance field that's, that's created from that. Um, at the same time, there's always the signal to noise ratio. There's a lot of crap out there. So you have to be discerning about what you watch, what you listen to, and whose groups you join into. Because there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of gang stalking and, and very nasty things that go on on the Internet. And that's, that's the other dark side of it. Yeah, but, I, think people, I think you have to discern. I mean, a, a discernment is really key and if you go into a place or some kind of eddy of something and just trust what your body feels i mean if you feel like you're being manipulated then you probably are so move on yeah. <laughs> you know go on to something else um you know turn off i i always see i'll give you a perfect example i'm going to call ancient aliens out Okay, when Ancient Aliens came on the air, it was great. It was great information. <laughs> it was a lot of wonderful things happening. But what it's become is kind of a monopoly and empire of <clears throat> everything is Ancient Aliens. I mean, how can everything be Ancient Alien? So the ratings were good. Money was flowing in. You know, this kind of thing's happening. And now all of a sudden, it's on all the time. And every single site in the world is Ancient Aliens. And every single topic is Ancient Aliens. And it's all the aliens. It's all the aliens. Well, it's not all aliens. I mean, that's just common sense, right? I mean, do I really have to say that? It's not all aliens. <coughs> no, it's not. And, um, yet we're pre and yet I have people who will come up to me and say, oh, my God, I saw this on Ancient Aliens, and this is the truth, and this is what's happening. And it's like, did you go and look that up yourself? Did you go to the site? Did you experience the site? Did you research other articles? I mean, it's just like, come on, guys. You still have to have... You still have to have your common sense in. You can't just let your brain spill out of your head and go all over the place and say, oh, my God. And think for yourselves because information is still information. And you, you, it's regurgitated. It's tainted. It's, it's got a perspective. You still have to kind of read through it, feel through it, pull what calls to you. And these are the synchronistic moments. And when synchronicity happens, you better pay attention. I don't yeah. care what anybody says about synchronicity being manipulated and, and all that stuff. There are certain things that are only for you, but you know that when that happens, you cannot deny the confirmation of what's going on. So I always tell people, go with the synchronicities. I mean, if you were just reading an article about a place and then all of a sudden something happens where you cross that again, that information again, well, maybe you're meant to go there or maybe you should keep looking into that place. And uh, I always like James Redfield's um, books about the, the insights. And he was one of my first authors that I read on a personal level that opened me up to synchronicity and he changed my life. 
Mm -hmm. And I live by that now. And I live by it wholeheartedly with complete faith. And if synchronicity is going to show up, I pay attention. And I feel sad for people who don't pay attention to that. Give us, give us a little bit of how that works for you. For me, a lot of times, I just notice it out of almost like the corner of my eye. There's just little things that float by and you're going, okay, once, twice, three times, okay, you got my attention. <laughs> and it could be numbers. It can be a thread that runs through things where I'm reading and then I read something over here and something pops up and you're going, okay, that looks like a puzzle piece that fits into this puzzle piece. So how synchronicity work for you? What do you see and where does it take you? God, that's such a great question. Nobody's ever asked me that, Randy. That's great. Um, where does it take me? It takes me to like the center of the universe. Nice. Honestly. Nice. Like, <laughs> that's the best answer I've ever gotten. Like the center that's of the, the universe. Best. And suddenly I can connect to everything. And yeah. it's like it's like all of a sudden I have access to everything. And it's like I can't even describe it. It's so funny that you asked me that. Um the process is like um it's like watching numbers light up on a field. It's yeah. like watching it's yeah. like watching a screen filled with numbers. Yep. And suddenly, I mean you can even break it down to binary code. I mean you could even say it's zeros and ones and all of a sudden I see patterns in them. I see certain things pop out. Um and I've done this by myself and I've done it with other people. And when I do it with other people, oh my God, it's the most it's better than sex, Randy. Nice. <laughs> like, it's the greatest feeling in the world. Um, because there is no denying. It, there's no denying what, what's happening. There's a phenomena that happens from it. And I think that synchronicity gives you little glimpses. And as you come in and you kind of glimpse it, you see it out of the corner of your eye. Like, oh, okay. But then when you're full blown in the center of the universe and you're watching all this stuff light up, and it, it shows you things. It's like an intelligence. I can't explain it any other way except it's like access to an intelligence that is not me, not you. It's just an intelligence that just shows everything. And you can look at anything and then you can break it down into, it's like spreading down the information and you can, you can look at something. And you can be like, oh, that, 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 that. And you start to kind of like realign it in your, in your mind and in your consciousness. And suddenly it makes sense and it highlights something. And if you follow that, if you follow that as far as you can follow it, um, when I go as far as I can go, there's, there's always, 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 it never fails. There's always something there that's extremely important. It's just a matter of getting into that space. I mean, I think that's really what it comes down to. It's like, yeah. if you can't get into that space, then you end up kind of, I mean, once you've done it, it's like crack for the consciousness. I don't know how else to explain it. <laughs> just, Better than sex crack. and crack for the consciousness. Right, okay? So it's like, this is, I just want to go yeah. back and experience that. And I want to find someone I can work with that will do that, that can, that can handle that level with me. I have not found a lot of people who can handle a level of synchronicity that I, I, can, I can work in. And I'm not saying that to be arrogant. Uh, it, it's just like, I, it's, I don't know if it has to do with the fact that I've been very open with my intuition and my psychic stuff and that that has helped i don't know what it is but i do i have met other people who can do it and some can go very very far with it but they always reach a level where they're like afraid of it or they back off and they're like ah it's too much and that's kind of like wow no that's when you're supposed to go further when you get to the too much part yeah. it's when you're supposed yes. to be like Okay, let me take a deep breath. I'm ready for this. Let's go and see what happens. And you know, I've only I've only really had that far out reaching where somebody's standing in the center of the universe with me one time with one person. Um, and it, it kind of spiraled out of control after a while because it became so intense. It became so intense that it was almost like it just kind of even. And there are forces at work that that try to stop it because. It really starts yes. to un, it starts to decode things and you start to see things and you start to put things together and, and in the matrix and out of the matrix and God, it's like 
It's like well, I think there's an inherent buzzkill that occurs when anything like that rears up. People get very scared very quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've talked about this on air before, so it's you know it's not really news to people that listen for a long time. We opened up a portal in the dining room of a Radisson. Ada. I believe it. I believe it. And 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 quite honestly, to this day. You know, it may not be the creepiest thing that ever happened to me, but it was the most profound because it was shared. Because that day, eight people sat there, and each one of them knew what was going on. Each one of them was experiencing the same event from a completely different perspective, completely different emotional states, experiencing time shifts, frequency shifts, a complete implosion of energetics that occurred in a period of 30 minutes that felt like variously four hours and 30 and then 30 seconds you have it a time, shift. You time said, expanding yeah. and contracting yeah. yeah for anybody that could and quite honestly when i came out of it you know i was kind of disturbed i was like whoa i wasn't ready for that was but i was and so were the other people they just it was it was a tap on the shoulder to go come on come a little deeper now yeah and imagine That's, if you did that for like a year straight once a week where you guys would be i mean yeah, think, well, about, think about the practice i mean honestly the way i do it the way that i've done it randy is it been it's been practice it's like you practice doing it you practice getting into that mindset you, and when someone comes along and they can do that intermixing it's like oh my god it's a miracle Thank you so much for showing up. And yeah. I have had the time shift experience, just what you just explained. I have experienced what felt like literally a 25-minute conversation was three hours. Where did the three hours go? Yeah. Oh, the sun's coming up. It's kind of like it, it actually, I think it lifts our consciousness beyond time and space and it's kind of like spooky action at a distance too because what yeah. happens which yeah. I learned about recently which is an amazing thing but what happens is when you observe something you literally change it from emanations to particles and the particles will change all the way back to the original point of entry origin so you're literally changing yeah. matter back in time mm -hmm. so you know, the fact that we just observe and then we observe together and we have these epiphanies and these moments and you're pinging off me and I'm pinging off you. Yes. I think what really shuts it down is our old conditioning. It's an old yeah. conditioning of, oh my God, I got to protect myself or, oh, this person's vampiring off me or manipulating me. So they shut it down. And they run away and that's fine because some people just that's just where they're at and there's no judgment in that it's just it's just a thing but every now and then you get lucky because you get somebody who stays 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 in that room with eight yeah. people or however yeah. many people yeah 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 it's a massive event and i i think if we all tried it and all did it oh my god i would love to be i would love to be alive to see what the world would be like if we were all doing that well i think you know there's this conversation that i'm having probably with about a dozen people at different times. And the vision is for us to kind of go there, to build communities that are able to bridge the gap from where we are now consciousness-wise into that world. Because that feels to me like the world we're supposed to live in. I agree. And I agree. There's something that stifles that, in the present societal structure, basically. The control paradigm. The, well, the control paradigm. We're so well-mannered. We're so entrained into the black box matrix that I was talking about earlier, which is a control program that is deeply embedded in us that we need to break off. So the idea of forming communities where we can, uh, it's almost like a re relay runner, hand the baton off so that, we don't get exhausted. We don't get burned out. We don't feel like we're being vampired. But at the same time, we have the ability to begin to open this up energetically. Because when you talk about spooky motion at a distance, that's part of the whole quantum thing that Nils Bohr and so many other mm -hmm. early quantum physicists were talking about. Well, they were telling us something. Science, magic are inseparable at a certain point. 
the the concepts about light and matter well light is both a particle and a wave or is it that it just shifts and what does that tell us about us it tells us that we're the observers that we're the actual catalyst that changes matter i mean so so here's like what i what i thought about this if i observe you randy i'm changing your waves to particles if you observe Mm -hmm. me you're changing my waves to particles. So I, I believe really it matters how we see each other. If I see you as an awful person, am I changing your particles to be that, mm-hmm. right? If I see yeah. you as a beautiful, light-filled, consciously divine, amazing, beautiful human being, does that, how, how does the quality of our observation affect matter? That's what I wanna know. I, I, think, that, I think that quantum physics the key to quantum physics is to get the feminine intuitive perspective into it. Okay. If you sat me down with a bunch of scientists, I would just be in heaven because I would be listening to them talk. But if they, if they dismissed, because questions bubble up inside of me and they come out intuitively and they just like, ah, well, what does that mean? And, and then I'm, I'm following because I'm sitting in the center of the universe and I'm seeing all these things light up and they're making sense to me, but nobody knows this is happening. And then I'll ask a question and then the question will, will guide me somewhere else and I'll see something else. And I think that we have the ability to do that, all of us, men and women. Yeah. I think that the women perspective, the, the feminine perspective coming into science and quantum physics specifically, there's something there because even though if you haven't been trained in quantum physics or you're not a scientist, you don't have a scientific background, if you're just given the conversation, if you're just given the synchronistic conversation and, and the people that you're in that conversation with are open to your questions and, and let them organically bubble up and happen and then they explain it or they think about it, oh my God, we would solve so many things. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I don't think you need to understand the physics part of it. First off, I think physics was simply a mechanism to retrieve something that we already kind of know. We know that we influence. We know that in our local field, our local universe, we influence energetics around us. You can walk into a room, as we talked about earlier. You can be a bundle of joy, or you can be a bag of piss. Either way, you're influencing the field within that room. And for people who have gone a little bit further in this, who have studied disciplines such as meditation, you know, remote viewing, remote influencing, things like that, you understand that distance isn't an issue anymore. There is no distance. The field itself is simply points on a matrix, and you jump, quantum jump from place to place, which is the consciousness shift that we're trying to work towards because we're still constrained by this, the physicality physicality isn't really a limitation we just haven't reached that point yet well we haven't been taught that i think if we went and unlearned a lot of the things that we've learned we yeah. should be better off um I, I i feel that we get stuck in a lot of these little eddies of intelligence that don't allow us to really move out or expand in different directions and it goes back to the flat earth moment where it's like we well, just took that one person to have that one thought right that one foot and it changed it changed the particle it changed the waves the particles and it did all this crazy stuff and we have a complete world built on that thought now and now we have another person who's who's kind of doing the same thing like being an innovator and saying well i have a thought and i have an idea i i don't think we should ever shut anything down and especially the generations coming up our kids the kids that are coming up underneath us uh i really believe that that people are born perhaps with a destiny and if a child is growing up and they're given the right uh, room for for growth and there's the right support and the right freedom we would have a lot of solutions birthed in this world that we need yeah. we would have solutions for environment we would have solutions for government we would have solutions for body and mind and soul and i and i just i, I I think we have to stay open and we have to realize that this is not about knowing everything or being in like, I'm right. And this is the way it is. And, and yeah. you know, you have no input. Wow. Because how do you know you're not shutting down that bubbly little voice that's coming up and saying, ah, 
randomly, synchronistically, and it's not going to trigger every single thing that you are inside of you. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great Absolutely. if I said something yeah. to you right now that you were like, oh, my God, I can't believe you just said that to me. And then your mind gets illuminated. I mean, this is what illumination is all about. It's, it's, it's not that necessarily about... Happen, though. And oddly enough, in this conversation, you've answered a couple of my questions in ways that were, I, I would have anticipated. So you do trigger, we do trigger these responses, and the more genuine, genuine we become in our responses with each other, the more I think that begins to occur as well. I mean, we all Absolutely. censor ourselves. Absolutely. I think that's the key. Yeah. I think if you can't be yourself around somebody, you're going to shut it down. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you, I don't always talk like this on interviews. I mean, it's not like this is, I come on to an interview and it's kind of like, well, you know, not everybody can bring it out, but you've been able to bring it out. There's a good, you know, there's a handful of people who can, but it's fun. It's a better conversation. It's a better quality conversation. And, uh, you know, I'm not thinking about the audience or who's listening or, you know, it, it's just, it's just it's an just organic, yeah, authentic we're just having... conversation. Yeah. And whoever's listening might hear something in it. And it's like, God, isn't that a beautiful thing? It's like a chain. It's like a chain letter. Remember those chain letters we used to get when we were younger? Yeah. You have yeah. to pass it on to 20 people, mm -hmm. win a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, though you were passing energy along, you may not have got the money. I'm not so sure that we didn't energetically invoke something in all of that. But we get the prosperity and we get the abundance of spirit and we get the abundance of love and we get we get we walk away from something feeling better because we've allowed an authentic interaction to take place. And I think that's yeah. the possibility in humanity yeah. is no matter what our skin color is, no matter what our gender, no matter where we live, no matter what happens, what language we speak, we have an opportunity to sit down and be like, I, I meet me as a blank slate don't know everything about me and let's see what happens. I'm mean, some of the most profound conversations I've ever had have been with total strangers mm -hmm. that I don't mm -hmm. know anything about beforehand. Uh, I meet and I get to know in that interaction and it's like, yeah. what a miracle. Yeah. I've met amazing people on trains and airplanes and on the street, um, places where, um, there's kind of a milieu around you of people who are just interacting. Concerts are great. People are a little looser there. The music seems to open them up. They get more authentic. Some of them get naked. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a wild scene, but it's okay because that's the known to human experience. And I would, I, I really like watching barriers to break down. I don't care what they are. I mean, we have to have, I guess we have to have rules and you know ways to conduct ourselves, and you wouldn't want people walking around naked all the time. But well, naked brings up sexuality, and it does, you. but it doesn't okay. have to. So I want to talk about that for a second, actually. Really, yes, because I think that's really important. And sexuality, uh, there's a higher level of sexuality that we have access to once we start to see. I, I see it, this is kind of like a money thing in the new age industry. It's like. Sex is like, oh, we don't, you know, it's just a one love and I love everybody and, and sexuality is, I, I disagree with that completely. I think what we're doing is we are, we are naturally drawn to procreation. We are naturally drawn to the opposite sex. We are naturally drawn, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble for saying that because I'm not saying that other relationships are you know, it's not a comment on, on uh, your sexual orientation, but we are drawn to each other biologically for procreation. So the sexuality aspect, I mean, what we just talked about with conversation happens with sex. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can get into a place where your mind is completely turned on uh, intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, uh, and you're filled with all these epiphanies and these moments and you are with your partner and you have an intimate relationship with your partner, the sex is great. Okay. Because it just ends up being an extension of that connection yeah. and the connection. And we have a, a zillion dollar porn industry. Okay. A zillion dollar porn. Oh, no. That it's, teaches people. It's amazing. I was just having this conversation a few nights ago, interestingly enough, 
we have a porn industry that teaches people that this is what you should look like. This is what it is. Uh, it's, you know, whatever you can find, whatever fetish you want, you can find whatever you want. And you, it, it's become kind of like an anti-connection campaign. And I think the porn industry supports the general matrix control because it keeps yeah. people from having profound sexual connection. And I believe mm -hmm. that there is a quality of profound sexual connection that illuminates your biology, you know, in the, in the act of procreation, in the act of conceiving the child. If a child is conceived in that level of energy, I believe that that mm -hmm. affects the consciousness of that child. And I also believe that, that it's for a purpose. How can that not have yeah. a purpose? If yeah. it's conceived in hate or indifference, or it's just the act of sexual, you know, a sexual act, it's just the act of it to self gratify or get your rocks off. It's, it's not the same thing as having a high quality interaction sexually. And I believe that, add the spiritual element to sexuality and you add the spiritual element to conversation i see a, a beautiful blueprint to change the world it really well the porn industry itself is about objectifying and debasing the act itself and removing the inner relationship aspect in favor of sensuality which is divorced from an emotional or intellectual context so, you know, what pornography has done now, because it's so available, I mean, you can't avoid it. I mean, it's everywhere. And it is basically removing from the culture any sense of true attachment to intimacy or the higher call to what the, that act is. Yeah. And so we're losing, we're rapidly losing a generation here. I mean, I won't disappear completely. But I read what's going on, for instance, and we'll get this will take us into, by the way, the sacred feminine. But I've watched what's happening with males now. There's a large movement on the internet right now of young males who completely cannot connect to females anymore. They're not necessarily gay. They're simply not able to, to connect with the female for whatever reason, because of you know bad upbringing. Uh, breeding. It's breeding. Breeding, yeah. It's breeding. But, but we, we now have a generation that's disconnecting from the original forms of sexuality, and in some cases from sexuality itself, and even more important from intimacy, the ability to connect to another person on a soul level, which takes us into the sacred feminine, which is, that was my introduction to you through our mutual friend, Dennis. Oh, yeah, Dennis. Hi, Dennis, if you're listening. Hey, Dennis. I, I know he is. I know he is. And we may bring him in. He, I, he may be able to call in then. We're going to put a number out towards the end of the show and maybe take a call. Um, for me, exploring the sacred feminine was a, a spiritual thing that kind of came out of a show I used to do called The Threshing Floor. And I began to look at God the way it was portrayed in the Bible as this triune being, and they were all male. And I was horrified at that. I was like, wait a minute. In the creation, there's a man and a woman. That's considered to be the perfect form of God's family. So how do you get Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and they're all male? So I, I, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm going to come I'm gonna come back to that. I, I went <laughs> back and I read. Holy Ghost is the woman. And when I go into a church and I listen to a service, and you know, or whatever, if I'm at a wedding or something, and they're talking about that, I'm like, why is she a holy ghost? Why is it a ghost? Where is where is the woman? And it's a mother figure. And it you can't a sexualize a mother figure. So it's like, where does the sexual feminine energy come from? The procreative woman who we're all born from, who carries your child and bursts it out into the world. It's like, where where is I mean, it's so convoluted. So I'm sorry, I just had to, I couldn't stop myself. I had to say that convoluted there's no easy answers to any of that the two dominant female fig figures are one the woman who supposedly tempted the man that caused the fall of humanity which created original sin and thrust us into this vortex of evil that we live in demonizing one, her has been a very effective campaign yes it has it's propaganda it's that comes from that malevolent figure 
that exists there that nobody wants to talk about. The other one is this virgin that gives birth to a Messiah, and she's unattainable because, well, who can do that? So, and being a virgin and giving birth makes completely no sense. You have to have sex to get pregnant, mm -hmm. to give birth, okay? So it's like they've actually, and this is a, this is a very, very well-executed uh, campaign against women, against the feminine energies, and it's been, it's been over centuries. And we've been bred to not appreciate the feminine energy from certain standpoints. We can appreciate it from the standpoint of taking care of the family, cooking dinner, raising the kids maybe, going out. It, it, there's certain elements of the feminine energy that we accept. Um, but there are other elements of the feminine energy, like a woman is not supposed to express her sexuality. She's not supposed to like her sexuality necessarily. So we've had a little bit of a, like a rebellion in that, and that surfaces up in a variety of different ways. Um, you know, Mary Magdalene was accused of being a prostitute, and, and, but yet back in those ages, there were women in the temples who were having sex with the, the priests and the pharaohs and the warriors because sexual energy was revitalizing to their energy. Mm -hmm. They had a completely different way of understanding sexual energy than we have now. Um, and so what, what we're facing now is kind of like a schizophrenic type personality with our sexuality as a whole because women are you know, they feel instinctually and naturally certain ways and they either struggle with the guilt that comes with that or the shame or, you know, they're not accepted by their partners or they're overly objectified by their partners. So, and I blame it on the porn industry. I blame it on the church. I blame it on different campaigns that have purposefully, you know, put the put the lid on the woman's voice on her body and, and just kind of shamed her made her the original sin so psychologically even subconsciously we've, we've grown with this idea that the divine feminine should be either a wholly unsexualized type figure or not i mean it's kind of like well, as long as she's the Virgin Mary and she's loving everyone and she's not a bitch and she never gets mad and she doesn't say anything negative and she never uses her fire to burn things down that need to be burned down, we're okay with her. But the minute she opens her mouth and says anything we don't like, we're going to tear her up, we're going to shut her in the closet, and we're going to turn her off. I mean, honestly, Randy, it's kind of like, and then if, I, and then if you say that, you're a feminist who's angry. So it's kind of like, oh, my God, can't we just be women with higher consciousness, beautiful sexuality, great partnerships, fabulous families, making abundant happenings and co-creating beautiful things in the world. I mean, honestly, we used to be a matriarch. We, it, it, there's so much proof. Yeah. Civilizations have been... Yes. The original way back before you know all the patriarchy all the church stuff we, we were matriarchal we were centered around the woman the woman was big and big breasted and you know she she knew who she, she was, was a fiddler who ruled with an iron you're only hot if you look like a porn star you have fake boobs and your ass is this big and if you're not that you're you're rejected and here's the thing well that's great and fine until you start seeing generations coming up who cannot connect to women because they are completely stuck in an ideology that is complete insanity and i think it's a product of, of over connectivity uh being able to get online and do anything you want connect with anybody you want anywhere in the world you have so many options you have so many things available to you how many people actually take the time to nurture one connection with one woman to the point of soul level quantum consciousness extreme i don't know randy i mean is it just me or is it just like god i mean I would love to hear the stories. I, I want to hear from people listening. If you have a kind of relationship where you've been able to nurture this amazing connection with one person, I would love to hear your experiences and I would love to do another show on that because I think it's so important to remember that, you know, the one-on-one -on -one is more powerful than the one-on-30 
or the mm -hmm. one on five yeah. or the one on indefinite. Well, I think that's been the war that we've been in. They've called it the war of the sexes. I didn't start it and you didn't start it. And to be quite honest with you, why is this important if I'm a man? What the hell is so important about this sacred feminine stuff? And why are you talking about this? Well, I'll tell you. Because, guys, let's face it, you get a little angry. You have a rage inside of you that's part of, okay, we'll, we'll call it fallen nature for the sake of convenience here. There's something else there. But... I know this because I have it. I feel the anger, and I know that that anger comes from a, a spiritual rip that's occurred as a result of detachment from something I don't have but I need. Because the male and the female are complementary halves. You call them twin flames, twin souls, soulmates. There's an aspect of me that lives inside of another soul. That complementary aspect unlocks something in me. And when I don't connect to it, I become a raging, hormone-addled male doing stupid shit, which is <laughs> what men do today. Men are stupid. I don't think men are stupid. I think men I can are say that. Really... I, I, I resemble I think, that statement. I think men are beautiful, honestly. I think... I think what happens when you have two people who come together and they decide that there's a connection and they want to explore that connection, I think it just, it takes time. And you're right, there's a rage that's inside both men and women that, yeah. because they're not being it seen is. who they are. They're not being... Yeah not being appreciated for who they are they're not being seen for that soul connection they're being seen in some other light or in some other way that takes that away from them and we were just talking about physics and how does how do how does it change you if i'm your soulmate and i see you as my soulmate how does it change you if i see you as a jerk or prick how does that change you vice versa i mean how do you see me if you see me as an angry woman how does that change me you see me as a divine soul level friend lover how does that change me so i think that we go back to realizing just how powerful we are doing the i mean we were born man and women as a duality so many people are trying to transcend duality and get rid of duality just like they get rid of the ego but hello people the news is you have it for a reason you have the ego for a reason and and you know what if 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 Mr. Freud never even invented ego. Would we even be in the predicament that we're in now? I mean, it's, it's literally, it's like somebody's idea came to fruition. We, we took it as truth, ran with it. And anytime we show a self-love or a self-gratitude or some kind of self-contained, whatever you want to call it, oh, you're an egotistical person. Oh, you're in your ego. Well, um, excuse me. I'm sorry, but self-care sometimes is vital. Self-love is vital. And so we have a very dysfunctional relationship with self-love. And uh, in, so I see a lot of things happening with the divine feminine, the divine male. I see when they come together in truth and integrity and uh, they stay together and they work together. Oh, my God, there's amazing things that come out of that amazing things that come out of it yeah. when they fight and they get in each other's face and they do all that other stuff um you can cause tornadoes according to the native americans you can cause earthquakes you can cause massive shifts in in the earth-based plane yeah. so i don't think there's a real clear understanding of of the soulmate issue and i think a lot of people misuse it i think they invoke it in other people without being responsible without really understanding what that bond creates um i think that you have to be careful if you're going to invoke that in someone else and or you're going to honor that and admit that that's there for yourself you need to really realize what that connection represents and how that will affect you moving forward so if you agree with somebody that your soulmates and that person reciprocates that and then you start treating them like crap or you start dismissing them or you start acting like they're they're not that important to you the effect that that's going to have on the person can sometimes be detrimental and in you got you have to have some compassion and some caring and some responsibility and some integrity when you go into those places. But it's a big topic. We could probably spend another two hours talking about that. I, I think the modern malady in relationships is that 
I won't say we all do, do it, but I think too many of us do it. And when you hurt that person, you also wound yourself. And I think mm -hmm. to a large degree, many people are walking around, especially multiple relationships, multiple marriages over time. Look, we all make mistakes. We're, we're flawed people. I wouldn't be the one to tell somebody to stay in a bad relationship. On the other hand, we have to learn how to heal and we have to learn how to heal our inner selves because that moves back and forth in the dynamic of a relationship. And a lot of the hurt that's inflicted is a result of inner woundings that we have. Well, you know, we haven't given ourselves, we haven't given ourselves the space to heal as children either, which is, you know, that goes off in another topic as well. Um, how the inner child is still, require nurturing and how we have to deal with that. So it's a, it's, it's a dynamic that has a lot of levels to it. And I, I think it's one that this conversation kind of opens it up to be explored a little bit more. Yeah. And I hope people have this conversation. Yeah. I hope that we've inspired people to have this conversation. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to have this conversations. I think it's important to give people a chance to, explore their feelings and and uh you know we've we've become a real quick turnover type culture well this isn't working so therefore on to the next or oh i don't mm -hmm. like this so therefore on to the next or you dismiss people for reasons that are superficial sometimes and and we just have to get our depth back we have to get our 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 depth i mean we're missing our depth sometimes and I don't know. I mean, some people haven't explored their depth, so they're filled with scary things, and sometimes those things come up, and you have to deal with them. But I, I have faith that you can deal with them, and I've seen people go through really open times with one another and and come and bring things to the surface that are scary and gross and and yet turn it into something really beautiful yeah. so I, I i think it's yeah. a beautiful thing and i think it's part of biology and going back to the conversation aspect and the sexuality aspect and then you go to the soul aspect i mean I don't know. I hope it's not a dying breed. I hope it's not something that's going to be phased out with computer technology and apps and random dating sites where you just swipe the person off if you're not interested or, you know, the Facebook hunting or the speed thing. dating. That was, yeah. that was, one, yeah, that, di that whole thing where you basically are just trying to, this is just another obligation you have to fulfill socially. Um, I find that really repulsive and i think that's Stay single then. and i have some yeah. advice for people listening and, I, and this is something i've written about at length before it's like if you go into a relationship and you have that connection with somebody and you go into that space and you have a beautiful moment and it it doesn't work or or you both one of you moves on or you both move on just be thankful that it happened because then you had the experience of being able to feel that and to process that so that the next time it comes into your space you recognize it and you might take better care of it next time or you might go a little bit further with the next person or vice versa so it's like our twin flame our soulmate may not even be incarnated our true soulmate our true twin flame might not even be incarnated on this planet right yeah. now but we might find glimpses of them in different people or, or one relationship or two or whatever. And uh, if that's the case, then be thankful that you have felt them. Don't be sad. Don't be, don't be thinking that you're never going to find that person or that that's just never going to happen or the relationships don't work out. Sometimes the soul is a little more long-term than just quickly figure it out kind of thing. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's worth sticking around for if you find the right person. That's how I see it. Yeah, I don't think it's a journey we were meant to go through alone. And I think a lot of that is just being, again, open and tuning in to what goes on around you and paying attention to the signals that you get. Um, I'm probably not in a place to give dating advice to people, but... Um, you know, hey, somewhere in that conversation, there was a couple of tips that come from experience and uh, uh, a desire to heal. Yeah. I'm, you know, it's funny. I'm looking at the clock and I'm going, oh, my God, look at it. We're, we, did the, we did the conversational time space jump, Randy. We did. We did. And, and it was like um, 
it's been so seamless. We just kind of really flowed with each other. And I don't, you know, one of the things I hate to do is have somebody on and leave things and go, oh, man, I wanted to talk about that. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to bring up, and it'll probably maybe tie some things together, is your work with this document called the Voynich document or the, the Voynich Codex. The Voynich manuscript. manuscript. The Voynich manuscript. So let's let's talk a little bit about that, how you came how you came into contact with us and what you discovered about it as a result of that encounter, because uh, you're giving me 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes to talk about this. You uh, have, you have more than that. <laughs> well, Voynich manuscript came into my life the uh, end of the summer, early fall, 2013. And I got a chance to go to Yale to see the manuscript in person I got to spend three beautiful, intimate hours with it. I photographed the entire manuscript. Um, God, it was, I was so cold to this book. It was almost like I had no choice except to show up. I was persistent. I was dealing with the curator of the Rare Book Museum at Yale. And uh, they almost didn't. I was told no twice, and apparently that didn't work for me. So I ended up keep. I kept going until I was given permission to go. And uh, the Voynich manuscript. I had no idea really why I was drawn to it until I saw it. And when I saw it, and touched the pages, and picked up the energy signatures that I was picking up on it, and just. That you know, bathed in these images, and I have since. Um, God, where do I start with this? You've put me on the spot with this topic. Even yeah, it's really we much bigger than we're going to touch tonight. But... but I thought we were getting to the end, so I thought we weren't going to be able to get to it. But the Voynich manuscript is a manuscript that was uh, found in the 15th century in France, and it was um, it was written in a language. For those of you that don't understand what it is or have never heard of it, it was it was done in a language that nobody's ever been able to translate. Um, they've had experts from all over the world come and take a look at it. They've had the FBI look at it. They've had all kinds of different uh, different language experts look at it, and they and they know that it's a language because of the context. The structure says very clearly that it's a language. It's very clearly a language when you look at it in person, uh, or even at the pictures or the images online. But it also has some very very interesting star charts in it. It has ceremonies in it. Um, I think it has what shows uh, plant cell section, microscopic plant cell sections in it. Um, it also has uh, mostly unidentifiable plants in it. <laughs> It shows women in and out of plant stems. It shows women in and out of these green liquid-filled con uh, containers or, or t you know, what could be considered kind of plant anatomy. And uh, one of the few identifiable plants in the book is the cannabis plant. So I always I found it <laughs> oh, Why am I not surprised? Yeah. The cannabis plant was in this manuscript, and it was one of the few identifiable plants they've had botanists look at it they've had you know experts look at it and, and they can't identify some of the other plants some people have suggested that it's a it's a it's a journal of star plants that come from other planets uh that were brought here uh the dogon have a has a wonderful myth where cannabis comes from sirius it's a star plant that comes from Sirius, and it was medicine given to us. The indigenous people that I've worked with have also mentioned something along those lines, uh, as well as coming from the Pleiades, uh, cannabis being from the Pleiades, cannabis being a medicinal plant that came to Earth to help people. Uh, we have receptors in the biological body that are made ingrained in us to yeah. receive cannabis. And I think cannabis personally has been demonized and it has been turned into something that is dangerous. You know, we're told that it's dangerous. We're told that it's bad, but I think it has the ability of free consciousness. I think that if you talk, if you talk to shamans in other countries and other cultures, when they do ayahuasca or DMT, they can tell you the inside of plants. They can tell you what plants look like. I mean, they can tell you what the medicinal properties of plants are. They can tell you, uh, 
how to use a plant. I mean, they, they come out of these uh, meditation trance-like states with clear instructions on how to use a plant. Yeah. And scientists have to catch up with them sometimes. So I think we have a whole huge unexplored realm within the human body and the plant world. And I believe that the medicinal aspects of some of these plants that are shown to us clearly in, in manuscripts like the Voynich or in other areas or even in oral teachings within different cultures, we have, uh, we have something happening. We have an ability for human beings to go into a plant, understand through consciousness what the healing properties of that plant are. You don't have to go to a university and learn it. You don't have to go sit in a classroom or take a workshop. You have to go into nature, sit down, meditate, take some kind of hallucinogenic perhaps, uh, and then go into a relationship, go into, go into a, 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 a space. You know, It's kind of like the space we just opened in conversation or the space you open yeah. up in sexual contact. It's mm -hmm. kind of like you open up a space with the plant and the plant will teach you. The plant will show you her secrets. But it's not going to show you the secrets if you walk up to it and be like, show me your secrets. You have to get into yeah. a stance. Yeah. Um, they have a lot of studies that have just come out recently uh, in a variety of different places. And I post these on my blog uh, or on my Facebook posts, uh, my different pages, um, where they've actually showed studies that plants will react to human emotion. They will react to human emotion um, in a variety of different ways. They will react to being hurt. Will actually send chemical signal signals to other plants. They will actually react to even the perceived threat of being hurt. Even, oh yeah, the thought, the telepathy. Yeah, I remember. I wish I could remember where I read that, but there was well, somebody who read a book. There, and, if, and if people really want yeah. to interact and know more, they're, they're more than welcome yeah. to connect with me, and I'd be happy to send some links. I have some great links for that. Um, but they've also showed that even in the roots, we have chemical releases through the roots to the fungi system. It goes out. It's like the fungi is the plant internet. And yes. the Voynich manuscript, intuitively, when I sat with the Voynich, and I sat with it for about a year, still look at it every now and then. When I sat with the Voynich and I would look at it and meditate with it, it was clear that there was a communication happening between the people and the plants. And the medicinal aspects were being shown through, and you, you can't understand it through the language because you because you can't. So therefore, you have to intuitively okay. interpret it. And, and people don't like me saying that who are scientific of mine or academic because they it kind of, it makes them uncomfortable and it pushes on their boundaries and it pushes on their parameters and how they're able to perceive information, digest information, they, they just reject it. But if you sit and you meditate with a plant or you meditate with an image from the Voynich manuscript, or you go through the whole manuscript and you take a look at the different ideas, and there's the Pleiades right there. So we're talking about different star <clears throat> We're talking about, you know, if you believe an ET came to the to the world and helped genetically alter, well, why the heck wouldn't they bring medicinal? Why wouldn't they gift us other things that we can then exactly. plant, yes. grow? Um, the Native Americans talk about corn being given from their star their star ancestors, their star beings. Corn was one of the gifts that they brought along with some of the medicinal plants. So I, I think we have a lot to learn still, and I think we have a, a tremendous amount of, of area to cover that we just don't have answers for. And as long as we stay open, we stay communicating, and we stay clear in our intentions, and we don't get caught up in drama, we will eventually figure all this out, Randy. Yeah, it seems like the clues are being sent to us. I mean, you just in the work that you did with the Voynich manuscript. And by the way, you can go over and read on uh, Hillary's blog. What? Tell them where the blog spot site is, Hillary. Um, I have a few different blogs. I, the Yin Factor, Y-I-N Factor, is my main blog. I also co-author The Intuitive Matrix with my co-author, Betsy Peerless. It's an astrological forecast. It kind of goes into some of the energies at play during the astrological significant points throughout the month. Um, I do uh, another blog called Mega Ritual, which is being developed now. It's going to be kind of a tie-in to current events. You know, you're kind of sitting there watching all the codes pop up. Uh, I tie it in with... That some sounds real interesting. Wow. Yeah. yeah. 
So I have the three blogs right now, and uh, some of them are republished on different platforms and stuff, but those are my main ones. So we've we've really kind of, and actually, by the way, you pulled that together nicely. That was a nice overview of the Voynich Manuscript. Uh, we didn't give you a lot of time to talk about I'm that. I'm a talk show host. I'm good at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, a lot of times we just condense things because really the goal isn't to deliver the entire package. It's to give you a sample and then make you hungry enough to go out and taste the rest of the wares for yourself. So... You, you, we'll, and when this show goes out, we'll put links up to all the websites where people can go and find you. Right, yeah. I can obviously get you on Facebook, Twitter, and other social networking sites from those websites. But there's, there was kind of a continuum to the conversation tonight that had to do with, again, this evolving consciousness and where we're at and the clues and the signals that we're getting. You know, you, you mentioned... Um, for instance, the Dogon and Sirius and um, the work that so many people going back to Robert Temple have done with the work on Sirius, which is, that's my, that's my touchstone. When I read um, Robert Temple's work, that was really where I began to connect with the concept that, okay, there really is something out there. There is an explanation for a lot of this. And we're at a point right now where we've got to watch the signals that are being sent to us because they're coming from the past. But oddly enough, they're also coming from the future at the same time, as weird as that sounds. I don't think it's weird at all. I think with the technology that we know about and some of the secret technologies that are being developed, I, I really believe the future is giving us a lot of information, actually. It is. It is. Yes. And I think that we, in the future, we have evolved to the point where we can, in fact, change things in the past. And so time travel right now, Dr. David Lewis Anderson, who I interviewed in 2000. Yes. Yes. Lucky you. You got to interview him. I got to talk to him before he kind of disappeared off the yeah, circuit. Yeah, he did. Um, Peter Moon works closely with him every now and then, and he does do occasionally an appearance in Romania when they do one of their mm -hmm. gathering conferences. Um, but he went from the private sector to the government sector a little after 2010. But one of the things he did share with me on the show was that he had actually developed technology where they could send information into the past. Time travel technology had developed to the point where it was uh, they could send information, which is key because if you think about it, and we are a militarized culture, the military gets the money and the funding and everything that it needs to create these kinds of things. If that continues into the future and the military in the future has devised a way to send information back into the past and we're becoming such a digital world, my thought and some of the things that I've pondered is that, well, if a military future has sending information to the back, you know, back to the past, we're kind of doing like, you ever see the movie Jumper or I'm sorry, Loop, Looper? Looper. Yep. It's like a time jump and they send yep. assassins back in time or they send information. Well, it's kind of like you send information back in time. Well, they want to get rid of this revolution leader over here. So let's knock out their descendants and send the information back. You got it all digitalized. You got the picture. You got the fingerprint. You got the, you know, you got the GPS location. I think we're, we're, we're it's kind of a, that's kind of an interesting uh, thought there. If you well, the, the 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 insider research seems to indicate that yes, we've been doing they've been doing that, you know that we've had things like Project Looking Glass that there have been. Um, Bill Brockbrader broke a lot of that information out as well as you know a lot of other people coming out of projects. But yes, there's been time manipulation. I talked about that at the beginning of the show tonight. That I sincerely believe we've we've seen time manipulation. I also think. In the end, the time streams themselves correct because human consciousness itself tends towards evolution. It tends towards the greater good. And ultimately, this technology battle that we're having isn't going to be won by technology. It's going to be won by evolving upwards the human consciousness stream. That's the real hope that I have in all of this. I don't trust the technology. I don't think we're I don't think we're going to walk away from technology. I think technology is useful. We are technology on yeah. one level. The, the word technos comes from the Greek. Yeah. So yeah. it's not inherently evil. It has to do with the fact that we have to make it subservient to us and not vice versa. 
And that's the battle that we're kind of in right now. But yeah, I think, you know, the time streams uh, have been manipulated, used information sent back and forth. And our future selves have also beckoned to us because that's where we live now. Yeah, and if you have technology that has evolved into the future, you also have consciousness that has evolved into the future. So exactly. I believe that we can communicate with our future selves and our future selves will send you know, things back into time, just like we send healing energy back into time. Reiki yeah. teaches you that you can heal things back in time. Exactly. So it's exactly. kind of like when you when you think of a healing modality that effectively seems to go back, you think of spooky action at a distance, you think of when particles change and it goes all the way back into time. I mean, it's really clear that it's a possibility. I think human technology, the body, the consciousness, the sexual energy, the, the knowing, the intuition, the psychic abilities, the intellect, the logic, everything plays a part in opening us up into fully humane humans. Yeah. But I think technology also has the ability to shut that down. And if you have the ability to go back in time to, to take out certain things or certain elements so that they're not problems in the future, so that it's more of a control thing, because we are dealing with that kind of paradigm as well. Um, you also have you know, the love attractions and the soulmate attractions that are trying to come back, you know, give birth to the ascended masters or give birth to the next generation of problem solvers. Uh, you can break that up. You can break that up. Yeah. Break up yeah. the soulmate connection because, oh, no, well, if your parents never met, never conceived you, well, then you won't be born, and there goes away my problem. So I think the soulmate love issue is a complex one, but I also think when – because when I usually freak people out when I start talking about that. I don't <laughs> talk about this too often, Randy. And I That's I why we're here. This is what we do. On this, and to be honest with you, I have seen – a tremendous effort to break true soulmates up. Yeah. Okay, whether it's digital interference or suddenly, you know, you start having all this kinds of stuff happen. I've seen a lot with that. And I sometimes wonder if that isn't some future spooky action at a distance going back and saying, well, military, you know, military wise, you know, let's break that up. Let's do this. But we can't fall victim to that either. So we kind of have to be warriors in the sense and we have to be really I was sitting here thinking about that we're, we're going to become time warriors we got to become time yeah. warriors and we have to say fuck that and just go for it anyway exactly not let it right on us. yeah yep not get paranoid not get scared not give up and just forge forward and keep doing what we're doing and stay in those mind frames of the higher consciousness because that, I think, in itself is protection. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It's protection and it's healing as well. Ultimately, we're time warriors, we're, we're healers, we're shaman and shah women, and we are people who are, I think, coming into our own and I can't help but think that there's going to be an interference with all of that there has been but humanity itself seems to be tending towards going upward anyway despite all of the well fuckery that's been going on with it so I give you the last word anything you'd like to say that we didn't cover any this is it. Last minute um, I just want to say thank you. I just want to say thank you for crossing my path at this time, having this conversation with me, letting me come on and talk to you, and you've inspired me. And well, thank honestly, you. I mean, I, w I just want to close in that energy because we covered a lot of ground. We talked about a lot of things. Yeah, we did. It all flowed really beautifully, and I'm just, this is my favorite thing to do. So thank you. Well, I think it was uh, a great conversation. I'm glad we finally got to do it. I think we opened some things up, and uh, I'm sure we're going to do this again when Universe directs us to do so. Hilary Ramo, my guest tonight for, I, I think, just a superb two hours. We did it without a break tonight. We had one glitch, and, uh, well... I would say the firewalls were working quite well. We're going to close it out here next week, by the way. Dennis Stone will be here, American Stonehenge. We're going to look at archaeology taking place right here on the American continent. That will be next Wednesday night. Off Planet TV, I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Keep looking for it. Namaste. Good night. Bye, everyone.